Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, thanks to VDAC and uh, Bear Elites for hosting this um, very interesting conference and uh, great venue as well. Uh, I really uh, got a chance to got to hear a little bit early and got a chance to look around. I don't know how many Monday morning events this place uh, typically hosts, but uh, more likely probably at the tail end of a Sunday night event, maybe at this time. But in any event, uh, I'm Chris Raffley. I'm with Cozen O'Connor. We're a uh, full-service law firm with uh, about 30 offices throughout the U.S. and Canada. I co-chair our healthcare and life sciences group. We represent providers and businesses uh, connected with the provision and delivery of healthcare uh, throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, I'm joined here today by uh, four panelists. Uh, on my far left is Dominic Carraza. He's the managing director at Berkeley Noise. Uh, Mike Ludwig, partner at MTS. Charles Brady. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. You, yeah, it is Charles. Um, Charles Brady. At uh, he's the managing partner at Health Catalyst Capital. And to my direct left is Jonathan Brayman. He's a principal at Blackstone. So, uh, as VDAC said, we're going to focus on healthcare today and investing in healthcare. And we'll start generally uh, uh, with our panelists. And But before I move into the questions, I'll give each one of them just a minute to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their uh, the work that they do. Start with Dominic. Sure, happy to go first. So, Dom Carraza here, Managing Director at Berkeley Noise, an investment bank based here in New York, focusing pretty exclusively on M&A across the middle market, which is an expanding market, as to say. Prior to that, I was head of healthcare for a merchant bank, also in New York, so head of both the private equity investing and the banking side, and then J.P. Morgan before that. So everything I'll say today is going to be from an M&A lens and a little tiny bit on life sciences, but mostly health healthcare services and technology. Mike Ludwig, I'm a partner at MTS Health Partners. Uh, we're a healthcare investment bank in New York, uh, San Francisco, and Tokyo, covering uh, M&A advisory and capital raising for healthcare services, technology, and life sciences companies. Uh, I lead up our healthcare technology and tech-enabled services coverage. Uh, I also lead our venture firm called Elements Health Ventures, which is an early-stage healthcare technology and tech-enabled services venture firm. Thank you, Charles Brady, managing partner of Health Catalyst Capital. Um, my background's been in healthcare investments since 1994, mostly on Wall Street. Left Wall Street in 2015 to form HCC to invest in companies using information technology, including AI and other technology. Um, deployed into healthcare use cases in ways that improve the human condition and deliver better value in healthcare. The investors in our fund include 10 large healthcare corporations, including uh, nonprofits and for profits, as well as uh, institutional investors. And our, our process starts with thematic identification of ways that IT can meaningfully change away healthcare is uh, delivered and meaningfully improve patient outcomes and uh, lower cost of care at the same time. Thanks very much. Nice to see everybody. Jonathan Brayman, I'm a Blackstone uh, principal. I've been with the firm for close to nine years. Prior to joining, was in healthcare M&A at Hulhan Loki. Uh, at Blackstone, uh, I manage a $24 billion portfolio of private investments across the capital structure. Everything from healthcare services, healthcare technology, life sciences, and pharma services. Uh, it's a pretty broad strategy. Um, looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Uh, and let's get started then. So I'll throw it out generally to the panel. Um, how are interest rates and more recently the geo geopolitical um, events uh, around the globe affecting uh, transactions in your, in your work generally? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say interest rates, uh, particularly the increase over the last 18 months has, has been a, a very large impact across uh, almost every business that we take a look at, particularly in our world, um, where a lot of the, the purchases of, of opportunities are, are using debt, um, it's, it's, it's a big, big issue. Um, and I think particularly for 2021 acquisitions that probably today, you know, you would say the multiples um, were not necessarily fair value, you know, those businesses are particularly over levered. Um, and in the healthcare sector and in healthcare services, at the same time, interest rates have gone up. You've also seen increases in labor inflation, supply chain disruption, all the things that we've been hearing about. And you need to really figure out what the sustainability of, of those businesses will be in this new environment. Um, it, it also requires um, setting businesses up from a new acquisition perspective with, with much more conservative 
uh, levels of leverage. Um, so how we're combating it is, you know, we're working with our portfolio companies. Uh, we're figuring out ways to optimize the business. We're using tech, AI, machine learning, different ways to, to find new opportunities to, to reduce costs. Um, it, it's become very prevalent in, in everything that we're doing. I'll just, I'll just add to that that um, I see it forcing discipline in investment underwriting, especially in the earlier stages where um, in a close to zero interest rate environment, some decisions could seem rational that no longer seem rational with normal rates of interest. I would also add that the labor costs have gone up with inflation and everything else, and that in healthcare is putting tremendous pressure on hospitals um, in particular given the stresses that uh, nurses and other staff went through during COVID, um, then coming out of that and facing in inflation at a personal level, driving a lot of people out of the healthcare workforce, that's increasing the demand for information technology and anything that can create efficiency and relieve some of the stresses, the day-to-day -day stresses of non-value-add work that nurses are asked to do in terms of documentation or referrals or other things that information technology can can solve for. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, I think strategics, companies and investors think about cost of capital and return on capital. And so when cash is at 5%, the hurdle, the bar is just higher, right? So if you're thinking about the asset classes of venture and growth into private equity and public, you've just had massive risk off almost immediately. So in the venture world, you have board members saying, well, we want you to grow at all costs, and then six months later, we want you to be profitable. And so it, the dramatic shift happened so dramatically um, that companies, boards, didn't really have time to digest it, but then you're looking at the market and saying, well, you know, I'm gonna go raise debt, and it was at 8%, and now it's at 14. And so that calculus, I think, people are starting to internalize that. I think that's why the last 12 to 18 months, there was a lot of just sitting and waiting we heard of a lot of private equity funds that raised a fund in 2022 or calling me and saying, we haven't done a deal in 12 to 18 months. That's not sustainable, right? And so I think that's where the next six, six to 12 months, rates are where they are. And I think they may stay there for a bit and maybe come down. Um, but people are starting to naturally return to, okay, if this is the current normal, what, how do we deploy capital effectively? Yeah, completely echo that. I think the next 12 months is going to look great for M&A activity to that point. The dollars have to get out the door, right? Investors have to invest. It's CO2 and oxygen, right? Uh, but to the phrase that was used previously, disciplined investing means cheaper investing, right? Multiples are lower, cost of capital is higher. So access to that funding from before and you know, pre-21 or pre-pandemic multiples are, are gone. And we're coming up on the end of two years of a barbell market. So you've seen value compress on both ends. And that barbell market is really large companies trading at a lower price, a lot of take privates happening now, and then really small companies trading. Healthy middle market companies that are founder led or initial private equity fund led at the moment, they have the time to wait it out to hope that the multiples are gonna bop back up at least that 15% that we've seen shed in the past year or two. But all of that's led for volumes to be quite down. So disciplined investing means lower multiples and it taking longer to get a deal done. How about the geopolitical unrest? Are you seeing that factor into, I mean, I know we're really talking about domestic, you know, typically at least companies are gonna operate domestically uh, in, the, in this country in healthcare. Are you seeing the, uh, you know, the Middle East situation or even Ukraine seep into the uh, investment strategies or uh, transaction strategies at all? From a banking angle, I've really only seen it directly with a number of technology companies obviously have assets and employees that are over there. But unless the business is, I haven't seen so much of an indirect impact, but mostly a direct impact where those companies have to reassess many more things that are more important than, you know, M&A activity and seeking out an investor right now. You know, the geopolitical uncertainty feeds into your first question. It's part of what's contributing to the higher interest rates. But I would say that in investors, in, in my experience, are more um, interested than ever in healthcare and in artificial intelligence because it's not directly impacted by geopolitical affairs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are, as a country, facing the tremendous cost of these wars, the cost of the higher interest rates, just as baby boomers are starting to cost the country a lot of money, in particular because of their health care expenses. So, so I think there's an understanding that 
the ACA, Obamacare, did not go far enough to address the cost of care, although it did expand access to care, and that something else is coming, and that something else is probably going to put more emphasis on cost of care. Um, and this is something that the country has struggled with, especially the entitlement programs. We think information technology can play a big role in bringing better health care at a lower cost to the country. Did you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I echo uh, panelists' comments. I mean, we obviously, are very focused on employees that are based overseas. Um, the economic uncertainty is, is obviously impacting the environment as well. Um, there's a lot of tech talent, particularly in Ukraine and Israel. Um, those are all things that, that we're, we're very focused on and, and making sure that everyone's safe. So let's focus a little bit on the kind of the players in the market. Who, from a clinical, um, clinical health care, let's say, uh, who, who are you seeing as far as maybe type of entity, not necessarily names of particular entities, who are you seeing as the most active players in the clinical space as far as transactions, uh, M&A? Uh, and again, I'll throw it op open to the, to the panel. Happy to jump in first. I think in, in clinical M&A, as much as we've had a really slow M&A market for the past two years, it's been the one forefront of healthcare that hasn't slowed down, right? So a lot of clinical M&A is based on inorganic growth and growing throughout on acquisitions uh, and realizing some gains in that end. So that's what's really been keeping the healthcare M&A market afloat while the rotation has been outside of technology. So I've seen activity really across the board, you know, behavioral health, ambulatory, just traditional clinical services. Uh, that's where a lot of the volume has been that we've been seeing for two years now. Yeah, I'll maybe jump in. We, so we have a $7 billion portfolio of physician practice management businesses, uh, includes women's health, fertility, uh, gastroenterology, orthopedics, oral surgery. Um, for a long time, the roll-up strategy was, was very interesting to a lot of private equity investors. Um, you saw that in dental, probably first, urgent care. Um, at interest rates where they are, it makes it very hard for those strategies to actually uh, be very productive from an add-on perspective. And you are seeing organic growth kind of slow. It's still low to mid-single digits, maybe GDP plus, while, you know, the theme we've talked about, labor inflation, has also impacted those businesses. So I say, you know, this year in particular, you've seen a, a, a lower uh, volume of those types of opportunities in the market. Maybe a couple of orthopedic platforms have come, um, some more nascent roll-up strategies, but it's hard to make the math work because the platform multiples, although they've come down some, the add-on multiples for smaller opportunities have actually stayed kind of in line, which makes that, that roll-up strategy very challenging. And so we've actually been prioritizing our, our new investment activity in HCIT and pharma services, life sciences, away from those provider businesses, you know, for that reason. And then maybe just one other comment is just in terms of reimbursement and, and costs, you know, for next year, you know, the, the expectation is costs are going up 5 to 9%. And reimbursement's going to get, continue to be pressured. And so value-based care, which one I'm sure we'll get into over the course of the panel, is becoming you know, more and more important as the quality of health care and the outcomes you're providing you know, are, are more um, you know, in focus. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'd add to what Jonathan said, Chris, is the tectonic plates that are shifting in healthcare right now are right in the bullseye of the question you asked around clinical M&A. And the most important um, uh, change uh, it, it, and a real historic change here is the acquisition of primary care physician groups by health insurers. Um, mm -hmm. United Health Group is the, the largest owner of primary care physician groups, their Optum division, CVS mm -hmm. and Walgreens both made splashes. So this vertical integration of the supply chain connecting uh, primary care with the insurer or with the retailer is a big shift. At the same time, hospital systems have been acquiring specialists in, in record numbers. So this creates a really interesting dynamic for those health insurers that can't afford to acquire primary care physician groups. We see them going digital through trying to create better digital front doors to provide primary care to their members through digital platforms because they can't afford the storefronts that the CVSs and the Walgreens or the Optums are buying into on the primary care side. Do you think that's a long term that that'll end up kind of replacing the storefront? Uh, are you? I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I enjoy having a, a CVS on every corner, sure. and there's convenience to stepping in um, to get um, things right away. Yeah. But um, 
you know, clearly Amazon has a uh, has a plan that they're that they're executing on. So, what 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 I think is really clear about the future. There's a lot a lot of stories still to be written. There's a lot of unknowns. What's really clear is that digital um, engagement with members is replacing more and more of the in-person. COVID was an accelerant. Yep. It allowed to break through a lot of the regulations that were barriers to. Now there's been a little bit of a pullback, though. It, Agreed. It, exactly. I think the the physicians have very strong lobbies, sure. and and uh, disrupting their business model is not. You know, and I've never been sure that the payers are sold on it either. I've talked to a lot of payer folks because I work in that, and I'm not sure that they're sold on the value proposition of it from a cost standpoint, but we'll see. Well, those that don't invest in, in digital will be disintermediated by those who can and do. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, any health plan, plan member would like the option to be able to get their care digitally, to have a chat or a video or a phone call with a, with a doctor and have that be reimbursed. So I, I think that's the way the world is going. Yep. The question is going to be how much they reimburse for whether it's, you know, the same level or, or not. But Mike. Yeah, I just go back to what Jonathan um, was describing in terms of physician practice management. And I'd extrapolate that to health system M&A. Um, the last five, 10 years, we're all about scale. Um, healthcare, people say it's a two trillion, three trillion, going to three trillion dollar uh, part of the market. I often think about it as hundreds, if not thousands of billion or $2 billion markets. It is still highly, highly fragmented and typically very local. And what Blackstone and other private equity firms have done has said, look at this, you know, from a scale perspective, we need efficiency through scale. Let's start acquiring and be a serial acquirer to get that scale. And that's worked pretty effectively for a lot of private equity firms to a point, right? At a certain point, scale is hard to manage. Um, you need to start ripping out technology. If you've got three different vendors, you're choosing one that takes years to do. That's where we are in the, I'd say, health system and uh, physician part of the market. But that's where, if you start, as you start, start talking about AI, ML, technologies, that's really where the efficiency in terms of workforce efficiency and scale take hold. You need large, sophisticated organizations to actually have the throughput mentality in terms of using technology and really investing in it. If you're a two-doc group in New Jersey, you're not going to be spending money on AI. If you're 40 docs, maybe. If you're 100 docs, probably. Right? And so that's where we are in the, in the life cycle of the market. Uh, and to Charles's point, five years from now, if you're not using that and you're 100 docs, no one's going to want to go to you, right? Um, I think where we're seeing AI, and, and we can get into this a bit, is as those physicians start to use technology, they don't really want to change their workflow, right? They just, it, they've been doing things the way they've been doing things. They see the technology coming. But if it's helpful, so one of the big parts of where we're seeing it right now, for example, is... Uh, and we talked about it, they talked about it a bit in the, in the first panel, actually, interestingly, is automating uh, clinical notes. So when you go to a physician, a physician's typing into an EMR, they've been doing the last 10 to 20 years, and, and by the way, they, we needed that money and funding from the government and also scale for those EMRs to be implemented. But now if you're a physician, you're typing into a note to one, document and get reimbursed, two, talk to the care team, and three, talk to the patient. You're also sitting in front of a patient trying to listen to that person, right? It's almost impossible. Where AI can come in, in my mind is, and what we're starting to see is, automating that next step. So say you go to a, a physician, you have a 30 minute visit. Um, certain companies right now are basically automating that clinical note, which is unstructured text. You get a text message in two seconds basically saying, this is what was happened, this, ha this is what happened in your visit. This is what the follow up is. Here are the next steps and here are the action items. Physician's actually not doing that, that's actually through AI. So it's a, one case study, for example, in terms of, how you need scale for one, right, where you have a large organization who's actually purchasing this. You need the, the um, autonomy from a physician perspective to actually do what you're doing, but in a way where you don't want to change your behavior and the technology is doing it for you, all of those things start to come together. So that's I just a lot going on in that uh, conversation. But as you think about healthcare, you know, large economy, large part of the market, how do you start inf you know, influencing, influencing, embedding technology into it? You need a lot of things to come together with scale. It's a great point, too. I mean, given the size of the healthcare spend, how local it still remains is really, is really uh, you know, unique, I think, to, to that industry, how, how the decisions are still made, you know, really locally. So I'm going to focus a little bit, and this may be a reverse on the, of the same question, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'll ask it directly. Um, as far as uh, who do you – view as the most, or what types of clinical healthcare providers do you view as the most uh, 
attractive targets right now for healthcare investing? Yeah, maybe I'll start. So um, the way that we're thinking about clinical outcomes is is being able to successfully manage through this value-based care environment. And so women's health care, fertility are, are one of those places. Uh, you're seeing great trends, you know, in those markets. Um, one, just from a, a patient education perspective um, and providing care, specific, particularly to, to rural communities that haven't actually had access to these types of services before. And because typically... You know, it's a nine-month period in which you're testing an outcome. It's it's very applicable for value-based care today. Um, and so, what you're seeing is these these types of providers implement um, some of the AI ML technologies to manage their population, uh, the data and analytics to inform their reimbursement. And so, it's it's really become table stakes. If if companies and platforms are not incorporating this, it's really not going to be interesting. Um, because the investment that's required and where the market's going. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that's really where we're, where, where we're focused today. I, I, I'll go for the um, underdog, the endocrinologist, who was never really in the spotlight and now is coming into the spotlight because of the rapid adoption of the get glip drugs like Munjaro, Ozempic, mm-hmm. and others. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of discovery being made on the uh, brain-gut relationship and how behavioral health is impacted, um, not just tactically by psychiatrists prescribing Ozempic to counter the weight gain from antidepressants, but also because these medications are shown to reduce compulsions, reduce urges, not just for eating, but also for smoking and for substance use and, and, and other things. So I think the role of the endocrinologist is the one that's probably evolving the fastest from where it was to where we believe it's going. Interesting, thanks. I would say, um, and it's not shocking, but mental health. We have a massive mental health crisis in this country and there's still, I'd say, a significant supply demand imbalance between uh, clinicians in mental health and the need. Uh, We have an investment in a business called Mantra Health, which is a virtual mental health clinic for college and university students. During the pandemic, which was a blip, I I understand, but more than 50% of uh, students on college campuses were clinically depressed. So one out of every two persons was clinically depressed. So, you you know, it's just a massive um, thing to understand, right? And so if you think about that, we don't have enough clinicians, and that's where technology and uh, virtual care can come in 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 terms of aiding into that need. Tom? Yeah, I think mental health and then broader behavioral health are, are great channels alongside with women's health for a number of dynamics, growing TAMs, access to reimbursement, but also there's a lot of room in there for the value-based care dynamics that Jonathan mentioned, too, that are here to stay. Uh, beyond that, just to you know, supplement some more, I think the PPM playbook, the physician practice management playbook that we were talking about earlier, that's here to stay, too. It's probably a, in lower and smaller funds than the Blackstones of the world, but chasing that next specialty uh, and creating these regional roll-ups and, and kind of a, a good, strong brand within a portion of the country, I mean, that's here to stay in, in cardiology and a bunch of other fields that we're looking at now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not along the clinical care perspective. But if you think about what we're discussing, you know, all these things require lots of data and analytics. And so what are the platforms that are driving that dynamic in the market? And so the way that we've approached it is, you know, outside of a clinical perspective, we've invested in those types of companies that are benefiting from those megatrends. I mean, AI is certainly a megatrend. Um, In order for AI to be effective, you need to have clean, interoperable data. And, and that's not an easy thing. Um, and so there's a company that we have $2 billion invested in called Innovalon. It's got the largest data lake of interoperable patient records and data. And so what it does is makes the connections across the continuum to say patient A, when saw this physician, it had this outcome, it went to this referral, it was prescribed this medication, and this was the outcome. In order to be able to analyze that, that is a really powerful thing. But if you don't have clean data, none of it works. And so what we're trying to do is find companies that are benefiting from those megatrends that will end up informing the clinical outcomes that are needed in this new environment. And, and that's kind of where we're, we're spending time today. Great, great. I want to come back to something that Charles said um, and, and ask you guys uh, just a real quick question to follow up on that. You know, we, we talk about the tools for value-based care. And I, I think we, you know, in my mind, 
the push really started back with the ACA in 2010. Um, and you kind of touched on this, Charles. Do you think there's going to have to be another push harder into value-based care? Because I think it was a nudge. I don't know that the uptick, I think we've prepared to, to do it, to, to really embrace it. And I think you can look at some statistics to say that it's much more prevalent than it was. But in my world, and I do a lot in this area, it's still a fee-for-service model generally. So do you think there needs to be another legislative or regulatory push to really push the industry into it? Or do you think it's going to happen on its own? No, I think there's going to be additional, additional nudges needed. Um, CMMI was created as part of the ACA and has been really brilliant at innovating Medicare away from fee-for-service towards more. This is an agency within the, within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid Services that was set up specifically to uh, for innovation, you know, innovate these types of yeah. all types of innovation, but particularly these p- new payment models. Yeah, th- thank yeah. you. And I, th- I think they're going to need to do more. And I think fiscal pressures are going to force that. There's a tremendous amount of inertia in the industry that needs to be overcome. There, the the government is investing heavily, probably over investing from a dollar standpoint because. It, it hasn't really been conclusively proven that much of the Medicare share savings programs that's driving a lot of the value-based initiatives is actually saving money. Some programs like the REACH program, um, in our analysis, is costing more money, but is priming the pump towards value-based. Um, I, I think that's a risky strategy because it's costly and isn't yet showing tangible evidence. So I think the government needs to be even more creative and work harder in partnership with the private sector and not so much in the ivory tower of, of uh, Baltimore and Washington, D.C., sure. to, to move faster towards value-based care. Michael mentioned we're spending about $3 trillion, I think it's closer to $4 trillion a year in health care. The world spends $16 trillion. One out of every $4 in the world spent on health care is spent right here in the United States. We don't have the outcomes to show for it. So we see tremendous opportunity to create uh, better care at a, to, to deliver better care at a lower cost. And I think this country is going to be under tremendous pressure to do that because the ACA did not do it. Obamacare expanded coverage, but increased the cost of care. And this is our looming fiscal problems are going to force these kinds of changes. And value-based care, I I think, is right at the heart of it. Yeah, I I completely agree with Charles. I mean, I I think I still fundamentally believe that people and companies are economic animals. And so if you turn off the spigot and stop paying people to do things the way they're doing, they will change their behavior. The problem with um, you know CMS is it's been slow, and as it should be, right? I mean, they should be taking data, they should be testing programs as they've done effectively, see what works, see what doesn't, but that doesn't take a year. That might take 10. And so we're in that you know five, seven, 10 year evolution of figuring out what programs work. You have a few administration changes in the middle, and it, interestingly, it's been fairly consistent across administration over the last you know couple, I'd say. Uh, but that takes time. But if you have a uh, health system in New York and they're shutting down left and right, if you, if you actually see any of you live in New York City, who's a fee-for-service provider, they will focus on ancillary, sur- you know, pr- ancillary services, so surgeries, cardiac, hips, knees, things that make money on a, in a fee-for-service environment, unless you capitate that and stop the, uh, you know, the total payment or have it come down based off an outcome, they're not going to change, right? They're going to stop mobile health clinics. They're going to stop mental health provision. They're going to be focused on what makes money. And that's not surprising, right? That's, that's economic behavior, and that's rational. So I think government, private sector needs to somewhat come, come together and do that. And they are, but it takes a very long time. Yeah, maybe take it one step further. I mean, CMS, we've talked a lot about, you know, in terms of lack of innovation. But even on the payer side, the commercial payers are not set up for value-based care. And to analyze the outcomes that a lot of the providers are, So we've invested a lot in our businesses, and it's very frustrating to see the payer environment not respond quickly enough. And so I think everyone's view is, although value-based care sounds great, you know, it's it's a zero-sum game. Some people will benefit, some people will not. But even in this iteration, given how slow the innovation's been, um, there's probably going to be, you know, another change uh, before we end up in, in, you know, that new world. Um, So hopefully, you know, CMS obviously invests in it, but also, you know, the private sector payers as well, the commercial payers. Mm -hmm. One quick comment, I think, tying it back to AIML and technology is, I think there's a lot of very similar parallels to what we're talking about with technology, right? People are saying, oh, AI is going to fundamentally change healthcare. It will, right? But I I have the view of, and I think it's said often, 
you overestimate uh, how much technology will change in one year, but underestimate it in 10 years. In 10 years, AI will be embedded in everything in healthcare. And if it's not, a technology and services provider will not exist. The next year or two, it's a lot of testing, right? It's just clinical notes. Give me a solid use case that has a specific clinical and financial ROI in 12 months. There aren't many, right? And so that's where we are. But I think there's a lot of parallels because there's so much capital and money spent. So people think about it, it's going to be transformative. It will, but it's not going to be next year. So let's focus what, with the couple of minutes we have left on innovation, okay, generally. And, you know, we've talked a lot about AI and machine learning today. But, but generally, um, how is uh, innovation affecting your tr the transactions you're doing as far as size, scale, and volume of transactions? Any, any comments on that? I mean, I know it's out there, and I know it's going to, uh, in the future, we're going to have a major effect on it. But right now, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, we, we've built out a 50-person team of just only focused on data science. And so what we'll do is we'll give them different data sets uh, from our portfolio companies. And if you pool all of Blackstone's portfolio companies and employees, I think we're the third largest employer in the U.S. behind Walmart and Amazon. And so that's a lot of data and information. And so we'll take all these different data points from all across the world in different sectors, let our data science team analyze them and then help produce outcomes. And that informs you know, investment decisions, how to manage portfolio companies, uh, pricing. Um, and so all of those things are very important and we'll continue to do that. I mean, you'll see that outside of healthcare and life sciences where I spend my time, I mean, Blackstone's the largest owner of, of data science, uh, uh, um, data mining capabilities and, and properties globally. And so you'll, you'll start to see you know, more things outside of just general healthcare as well um, where people need to spend time in order to be productive as well. We continue to expect to see disruptive innovation come from innovative teams, uh, typically small companies. I think companies with three, four, five million in revenue that have proven an ROI with an insurance company, a hospital system, a physician group, or others that have a a better technology um, are where we expect to see the best investment returns. And I, I think the challenge for very large organizations, although they have the budgets for innovation, a lot of innovation um, cannibalizes existing business. So that's made it historically hard. So we, we, we look for those innovators that are starting to have an impact, that have a lot of growth ahead of them. We expect a large company will wind up acquiring them one day, but that the, the, the real innovation is gonna come from those smaller teams that, that are, are focused on disrupting the status quo and not from the companies that are benefiting from the status quo. And that's probably the way it's been in most of these type of where you have changing markets, usually that's the way it, it works. Ex I would exactly, imagine. yep. I, so I would add on that and say I think it will be barbelled. So this is, this is the one opportunity in my mind where for five, 10 years you've been saying IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, et cetera, will come into healthcare. They, they have and they will, but from a strictly technology perspective, going to Jonathan's point, scale matters, right? And so if you're a three million revenue company, you will innovate, you will have a specific technology that is best of breed and you will probably be acquired. But in terms of 80 data scientists or a thousand da data scientists, right? Scale is just transformative and Google will start signing partnerships they have with an HCA, which is the largest for-profit health system in this country, right? You're gonna start to see more of that where you have scale, billions of dollars invested in R&D and that start to enter the space, which is great because it's much needed. Yeah, I think on the you know chasing innovation side of the investment piece, it's it's we've seen less activity in the past two years than you would think, given all of the hype and you know re requisite hype and appropriate hype around the change in technology. But I think there's some apprehension from investors of the fear of those scaled players that something about that's going to be insurmountable. So on year three or four of my hold, does Google or Amazon take? completely dominate that market that I had a good run at for two and a half years. So I think there's some apprehension on that. That also creates a really high diligence bar of just stress testing that technology on that $3 million revenue business to begin with. And then the third piece that's really slowing all this down is just a lack of reconciliation on price expectations of that innovative three to $5 million revenue company and where tech multiples are today. So I think because of that, we're seeing less activity, but a lot of chatter and things will happen. Uh, but from the banking perspective, haven't quite seen it yet. 
It's actually, just I'll hit that, it's a great point, right? So if you think about, let's give an example. There's, there's something in this country called telesitting, right? Where, and scribes. So they pay, you know, low-wage employers to sit there in a hospital with the clinician and, and, and the patient, sitting and just typing, right? Do you think that'll be there in 10 years? Probably not. But if you're a hundred million revenue company and 20 of EBITDA doing telus, you know, scribe, uh, scribe or sitting, um, is that a good investment for the next three to five years? Maybe, right? Because those folks may nuance and others may not be able to truly extrapolate that into structured text in a way that it's understand it's understandable for the patient in the next three to five years, 10 years probably, right? So I think it's a great hypothetical of if you're an investor, it's, a, it's an interesting paradox where these businesses may not exist in 10 years, but they're fundamentally great cash flowing businesses, right? And so if you're a lender, what is the true underwritable risk? I, I don't know, right? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about in the context of AI, um, you know, not necessarily supercharging, but pot potentially displacing industries. Okay, I think we might have just a minute or two left. And so I'd want to ask the panel um, just before we conclude is, um, is there any uh, thing that you're going to be looking at in the next 12 to 18 months with respect to healthcare investment that's like a bellwether that you could leave any of the folks with to say, hey, look at this, and this is going to tell you the way things are going to go? Just, just curious if you had a, uh, anything that you look at in that, in that way. Yeah, maybe from the pharma services perspective, which we haven't really spent any time talking about, um, there's a lot of technology that can be applied to that process. It costs around $2 billion to bring a drug to market. Uh, it's very inefficient. There's a lot of inequalities in terms of who participates in clinical trials. And so the, the incorporation of AI and technologies into that process, one, will help reduce the costs to help bring medicines faster to market, but two, make it more equitable um, because that, that's obviously a large problem. And so, you know, across that, that whole chain, you're seeing already CROs or um, CDMOs, you know, uh, bring that into their, their, their process. Um, and so I'd say that's probably where we're spending more time. Uh, late stage phase three recently commercialized assets. Um, it, it's going to be important uh, for these companies uh, going forward. Great. Charles? So I feel like the train already left this uh, left the station with, um, and the seminal event was probably the passage of the High Tech Act by President Obama mandating the use of electronic health records, which took us from only about 20% utilization to now well over 90% utilization of the EHR. Because without putting records, without digitizing records, when when doctors were writing notes on charts, that data couldn't be used. Right. And now these data scientists have data to work with because data is being put into these these EHRs. Now, ironically, I guess with AI and machine learning, maybe it's not as critical that it goes into that structured format, but maybe not. Well, you know, I, I think it is because when data was trapped in your cardiologist's office um, on, on her shelf, it wasn't being used. Right. It wasn't able to train the AI models. Yeah. And so now, so, so, so I think that seminal event is behind us. I think the trains left the station. It's, it's gone for good. I, I recall in the late 90s, early 2000s, health insurers were giving doctors free Palm Pilots. Yep. And there was a view that information technology was gonna start disrupting healthcare during the dot-com bubble, and it didn't happen. Um, and so it feels like this time is for real. Yep. Uh, physicians and other medical practitioners I mean, have you smartphones could say that like all of us do. the 90s with value-based care, right? The risk contracting that occurred and there was a and huge the pullback and there really wasn't the technology right. to do it. Just real quick, Mike and Dom. Yeah, I just echo uh, earlier thoughts around structural imbalances in healthcare. Um, there's real supply demand issues that need to be fixed, typically through technology. And there's a lot of burnout, right? Even with the supply, the supply doesn't want to be the supply anymore. If you're a nurse <laughs> and you've been practicing for 25 years, you're retiring and there's going to be a cliff. And so how do we think about investing and using technology that solves that issue? It's not necessarily solved, solvable, I should say, uh, but there are going to be technologies and companies that uh, tackle that problem. Yeah, I think two fronts, one of which is Mike mentioned this use case for AI earlier, where it, an ambient listener is now note taking on behalf of the EHR. So it's really high tech act step two, right? I think watching the development of that singular use case is going to be indicative of how far AI can go in this slow moving beast that is the healthcare industry, right? We've been talking about capitation for most of our lives up here. Uh, and CMS is going to move slowly. But that 
I think is the best AI use case adoption where every single angle across that tool is a winner. Uh, the economics are there, the provider gets time in their day, et cetera. So I think all eyes on that one to see what will happen next. And then in terms of your other investments, as you're thinking about tools, RCM, et cetera, think about a company and its ability to increase its operating ratios or just perform better with the use of tech, whether they develop it or an expectation of a third party tool that will come soon. Okay, thank you. I think that's, um, we, have, we have another 10 minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Um, then uh, let, let's go to the kind of the legal side, something a little bit closer to uh, or near and dear to my heart. Oh on the, What's that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hold your excitement, please. Um, but just wanted to, you know, we've come in, in, in certainly maybe from 2020 and 2021, deal flow has slowed a little bit in healthcare and in most industries and certainly in healthcare a bit as well. Um, on When you're looking at a deal, has the way you look at companies – uh, or potential targets changed? Uh, is the due diligence more? I mean, I, we've all done a lot of deals and they were coming so hard and fast where, you know, I think we've been on a lot of deals where, wow, you know, the, the due diligence is done quick and it's done however it's done. Is that changing or uh, when you're looking at a, a deal kind of on the front end? Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think the diligence process has changed. I think even in 2021, when there was a lot more activity, you know, you still had to have a very rigorous process and utilize your third party providers. Um, and, and today, I'd say maybe you have more time because the deals are less frequent in, in the market. So maybe you could go a little bit deeper and you're not quite as rushed. But, right. you know, it's, it's such an important topic um, that you really can't miss. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it's, it's more important than anything. And it really hasn't changed. Yeah, I would echo that 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 comment. Um, I, I would add that one area where complexity is increasing is um, FDA as it relates to digital, and so I would say that the compliance and diligence needs are growing in digital as regulators, the FDA and others, are getting more involved, establishing standards, oversight, et cetera. I, I think it depends on the part of the market, right? So where you're playing, which is later stage, I think it's been pretty consistent. I think um, terms may have changed in 21 and 22 to be responsive to a really attractive market. Um, but the diligence process was accelerated, but still probably the same. The venture part of the market, it was the wild, wild west in 21. I mean, people were doing things that were completely irrational, throwing out term sheets, basically no diligence. I think part of that was you had uh, what we call the tourist investors, t folks that weren't typically healthcare investors that came in, put a lot of money in the market very quickly and thought it'd be the same as general tech, right? And so didn't understand the regulatory aspects, didn't understand that you've got to deal with health plans and health systems and pharma companies. Um, and not to discredit them, I think it's a great opportunity, but they have pulled back quite a bit in the market, right? Uh, the growth part of, part of the market's probably somewhere in between um, where growth equity investors are typically having a similar style of diligence to private equity but because the, and I'm not going to name names, but uh, public funds came into the late stage private part of the market, uh, again, they were starting to act somewhat irrationally like venture investors, and the growth equity community was very perplexed, is how I'd put it. And so I think a lot of that has changed. That's also why the venture and growth part of the market, I say, is the most acutely hit in the last 12 months in terms of velocity of deal flow, uh, because they're back to diligencing companies the way they should. They should be hiring counsel. They should be reading contracts themselves, right? Things that are pretty normal that they were just not doing as part of the 21 and 22 bubble. I'm not even going to talk about SPACs. MTS, we sponsored our own SPAC. We merged it with a public company, um, SOC Telemed, that was taken private. We had a number of meetings where I was shocked, where I was sitting in a 60-minute meeting, and a pipe investor said, yeah, I'm in for 20. Based off what? Well, just you know, based off the 60-minute presentation. That was the level of diligence you had in 2020 and 21 with SPAC. So I think that has changed, and I think for, for the better. So back to normal in some, in some respects. Tom? Yeah, echoing all the same. I think deals are taking longer. Diligence processes have become elongated, but it's more so a function of just market activity and the fact that there is more time in the system to look at things in other you know, rotation. Uh, but I also think the tech diligence has evolved a little bit over the years. It used to be really just code scans to make sure the company owns what they've built. Now it's beyond the code scan, it's checking for other compliance risk, you know, PII exposure, cyber uh, security attacks, everything. So like that development of the, it's really one third party vendor of your deal process, but what used to take 
one week, probably take six now under LOI. But other than that, largely the same. Great, great. Well, I think that takes us to the end there. Um, want to thank everybody and certainly thank our panelists. Uh, very interesting, and I'm sure more discussion will be had at the informal sessions, networking sessions that follow. So thanks a lot, uh, and looking forward to speaking to all of you uh, throughout the conference. <laughs>